Okay, so we are now going to be looking at decision one, and we're starting with chapter one on algorithms. And sometimes people think, oh, this is a very simple chapter, but there are some parts in here that they have got quite interested in doing lots of exam questions on, um, and they're pretty easy to drop marks on. So we're going to make sure that we definitely nail all of those things there. Now, more broadly, my aim in decision one is to try and give you the intuitive approach to the algorithms you're going to be applying many times. And really what I mean by that is I want to teach you why the algorithm was designed in that way and what it actually does rather than just trying to remember a list of different things that need to be done because ultimately that's where things get confusing and, and you kind of can't do as, as good as you could. So once you've understood this, you'll easily remember them for, for um, you'll easily remember them for the reasoning that's going on behind them instead of just like a list of instructions of things that you need to do. So later on in D1, these are the algorithms that you're going to be able to learn to do that are going to help you to sort lists into ascending or descending order. I've said, wow, yeah, of course we know how to do that as just human beings, but we're going to be thinking how like a, a computer might be designed to do that. How to con fill containers effectively, sort of. Sometimes we don't fill them very effectively. Um, and then later on in D1, these are in the, the first chapter, we're going to be connecting places together with the shortest amounts of roads, finding shortest distances between places, traveling all of the roads in a particular area in the best way possible, visiting all of the places in an area in the best way possible. And then later on, we're going to be solving problems with lots of constraints like the available resources or demands on production levels and then in the last chapter we're going to be planning projects effectively which means including all of the tasks the timings and allocating workers and resources to eat each task so this is really like the summary of what goes on in decision one and this is the summary of everything that's going to be happening in chapter one here now, I wanted to include this little bit down here of a mathematician, a Muslim mathematician called Al-Khwarizmi. And when his name was written into Latin, when it was written down not in sort of Arabic script, this um, surname was, even though it's actually about a place that he comes from, was written as Algorithmus. And this mathematician here, he was an incredible mathematician who basically did tons of stuff to do with algebra, but also had a lot to do with arithmetic. And arithmetic is obviously the process of like multiplication, and addition and multiplying and he kind of formalized the process of some of those algorithms in other words those those steps that you follow to perform those calculations and that is where the name algorithm actually comes from because this surname al when it became algorithmus it has now become algorithms and it's now not used just for arithmetic it's used more broadly for following a set of instructions that we've got there so i always think it's quite nice to think like where do some of these words actually come from Okay, so and this is just his name in Arabic script, and this is roughly the time that he was alive. So we're going to start by thinking about what an algorithm actually is and how we implement it. And we're going to use this idea of something called a trace table here. Really, it's just pretty obvious. I think you could probably do this without my instruction. So following algorithms and algorithms are sets of instructions to help perform a task or solve a problem. It should be easy if they are well written. A trace table, which is this thing that we've got here, can help keep track of what is going on. There's no need to follow strict rules with these, just make sure that it's clear what you're doing. So sometimes in the textbook they have like, oh, you know, step one, do this, then step two, do that, and it's all kind of a very long trace table that they have. I've looked through all of the exam questions, I've looked through examiner's reports, anything I tell you in these videos is always going to be sort of the best advice that will hopefully save you time and also make it easier to understand what is going on. So like I've said, there's no strict rules about how to fill them in, just make it clear of what's actually going on here. So for this first example of what the algorithm actually is, we're going to implement this following algorithm in a trace table that I've drawn over here. And if it were in the exam, they should give you that trace table to begin with. OK, so first thing that I'm going to do, I just need to switch to my normal fountain pen, um, is it says here, let n equal 1, a equal 1, and b equal 1. OK, well, let's just put 1 in all of these places that we've got here print a and b okay so that means at the bottom print means just kind of like write it out so a and b is one and one um let c equal a plus b so c is equal to a plus b that means that it's two and then it says print c let n equal n plus one so n was one i'm now going to add one onto it and i'm going to call it two let a be equal to b okay so a is now one and let b be equal to c if n is less than 5, go to 3. OK, well, n is less than 5, so I'm going to go back here. And it says, let c equal a plus b. So c is going to be equal to 1 plus 2, which is 3. And then it says to print c, so I'm going to do that. 
And you can see what's going to happen here. We're going to say n is now increased by 1, so it becomes 3. a becomes b, and it says that b becomes c. And then we're going to go back up to this part. We're going to let c equal a plus b, which is 5. And then we're going to print c so that it's 5 there. And then it says here that if n is less than 5, okay, we're still going to keep going. So I'm going to add 1 onto n, um, which now means I can pull b across as a, c across as b, and then we're going to do this part of the algorithm. We're going to let c equal a plus b, uh, which is 8, and then we're going to print it. Okay, so we're going to print c. After I've printed C, I'm going to increase N by 1, so it becomes 5. And A is going to become 5, B is going to become 8. And then it says, if N is less than 5, go to 3. If N is equal to 5, stop. Okay, so we've done the algorithm. We've used the table to help us figure out what's going on. And what does the algorithm do? Well, it printed these numbers that we've got along the bottom here. So what does the algorithm actually do? Hopefully you can recognize this is it prints the Fibonacci sequence. It prints the Fibonacci sequence. I think I've spelled that right. Now, yeah, you might not need an algorithm to do this, but if you think about how com computers are made, computers don't have brains in the way that we're thinking about things. They are always being told exactly what to do, to do next. And so this is why algorithms, sometimes if I'm like, yeah, I want to tell you what the Fibonacci sequence is, obviously that's quicker to do. But designing this algorithm to make it produce the Fibonacci sequence is like a different kind of thing altogether. So that's kind of a bit of the flavor of what's going to be happening in decision. Okay, so we'll have a look at um, an exam question using a trace table. It's only from the AS paper. I haven't seen it in an A-level paper. And basically, they're pretty broad about how they give you the marks. They don't need it like a step-by-step. -step. You just use the table to help you do the calculations. So we have a following algorithm to produce a numerical approximation for integration. If you haven't done integration yet, just skip this part. You don't need to be able to do this. Go straight to exercise 1A. They've got the algorithm here, and they're telling you that they've got some input values to begin with. And we're basically going to do the algorithm for these values and fill them into this table and state the final output. So number one, it says start input the values of a, b and n. So it is a, b and n. And it says let h be equal to b minus a divided by n. So that's 3 minus 1 divided by 4, which is 0 0.5. So h is equal to 0 0.5. And then it says let c equal h divided by 2, which is 0 0.25. And let d equal 0. And then the next thing we're going to say is that d is d plus a to the 4 plus b to the 4. So that's 1 to the power of 4. I'm not going to include the 0, plus 3 to the power of 4. So d is 82, and I'll put that on a new line. And let e be equal to a, which is a 1. And then we're going to let e equal e plus h. So e plus h is 1 plus 0 0.5, which is 1.5. And if e is equal to b, if e is equal to 3, so if it ever gets to 3, we're going to go to step 12. Otherwise, we will just um, we will continue with what it's saying here. So we're going to say that d is now the previous value of d plus two lots of e to the power of 4. Obviously, we're doing bid mass here, so we need to do 2 times e to the power of 4, first of all. So I'm going to do 1.5 to the power of 4. I'll times that by 2, and I'll add on the previous value, which is 82. And we should get, if you've done the same as me, 92.125. Now we go to step 8, because that's what it tells us to do next. So I'm going to increase e by h, so it now becomes 2. And it's not equal to b, so I'm going to do that same process. So I'm going to do 2 to the power of 4, times it by 2, and I'll add on that previous value, which is 92.125. And you should have 124.125. So we're going to do the next part of this, which is said that now um, go back to step 8. So I'm going to increase e by h. So it's now going to go to 2.5. We're going to do that same process. So that's 2 times 2.5 to the power of 4 plus 124.125. And we get 202.25. So that was our step 8. We're now going to throw that was this part here. We're now going to go to step 8, which is to increase e by h. And it now becomes 3. And so it says if e is equal to b, go to step 12. Well, it is equal to b. So I'm going to go to step 12, which is that f is c times d. 
So I'm now going to let f be equal to c times by d. So I'll multiply those together, and that will give me my value of f, which I can just put on the table, which is 50.5625. So we've completed the table in the answer booklet, and the final output is 50.5625. Okay, then for part B, it just says, calculate to three significant figures the percentage error between the exact value of i and the value obtained from using the approximation to i in this case. So this whole process, this is trying to do, the. this is what the question was actually trying to do. It was trying to find an approximation between this. We were trying to find an approximate answer for integrating that, and we've said it's approximately 50.5625. So what I'll do for part B of the question is I'll find the true answer for this. So I will integrate so that I get a fifth x to the power of 5 between 1 and 3. So it's going to be a fifth of 3 to the power of 5 minus a fifth of 1 to the power of 5 so that I get the true value. So it's 3 to the power of 5 divided by 5 minus 1 to the power of 5 divided by 5. And we get 48.4. So our percentage error, if you can't remember this from GCSE, it is the difference between them divided by the true value multiplied by 100. So the difference is going to be our 56 point, oh, sorry, not 56, 50 point five six two five minus 48.4 divided by the true value, which is 48.4, and multiplying that by 100. I'm going to do that through three significant figures. So that's 50.5625 minus that 48.4 divided by 48.4 and times it by 100, and we get 4.47%, and that is to three significant figures. And obviously our answer was a 4.47% 4. 4. 4. overestimate. So let's double check we got this all right. Yeah, there's everything in the trace table, just like we had with the final output, and we got the 4.47% there. So this is the only question I've seen on this, but you can just use the trace table in whatever way you want. If you look in the textbook, they say like, oh, you must move on to a new line for this. I've checked with all the examiner stuff. It's absolutely fine to do it in the way that I've been teaching you. So go and have a go at some of the questions from exercise 1A. And in the next video, we'll have a look at some more stuff to do with flowcharts.